All right, these are the classical Greeks. We have finished talking about the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. We just found out recently that these people existed, and now we're on to the classical Greeks. A time period we're looking at is from 700, as the Greeks come out of the Dark Ages and into back into civilization, and we'll be taking the classical Greeks up to 300. That's the time of Alexander the Great. Alexander dies in 323, and with his death, we call that the end of the classical Greek period. So at around 700, they come out of the Dark Ages. All these city-states come out of the Dark Ages. What used to be the Mycenaean world has been come back to civilization around 700. And they have these stories. They have these legends from 500 years ago, the legends of the war against Troy, when all the Greeks got together and figured out a way to defeat the city of Troy. And that's about the time that they'll write that story down, the time of Homer. As we come out of the Dark Ages, we see uh, an evolution. There's a, an evolution that's taken place in Greece. The idea of a polis, the Greek polis. Uh, there are hundreds of these. This is the town, a polis. The definition of the word is a town and the surrounding area so that people could live in a town but then control a certain radius around them. So that would be the polis. There are hundreds of them. Around 700 B.C. as they come out of the Dark Ages, they have scattered all over the mainland of Greece, the islands, all the way over to Asia Minor. In other words, what used to be the Mycenaean world Many of those cities no longer exist. Mycenae had gone away. Some cities had remained. For instance, Sparta had survived through the Dark Ages. But all around the Aegean Sea, this is a Greek lake. One thing that uh, you recognize when independence, when, uh, when civilization returns, is they're independent. They're not like any other city. They don't communicate very well with them. There's no unity. Occasionally there might be an alliance, but mostly they are independent. You don't see a unity. They end up as antagonists to each other, so they're happy to have survived the Dark Age, but they don't unify. The interesting aspect about the Greeks is to look at their government. They wrote a lot during this classical period. That's how we know so much about them. And they wrote a lot about their governments. Each of these city-states, these poles, will come up with a unique form of government. So that's kind of interesting to look at, especially these are the founders of Western Civ, Western Civilization. So it's interesting to look at government. Looking at the Dark Ages, what they had in the Dark Ages was kings. This is a, the simplest form of government, the biggest, baddest guy to make you survive in the Dark Ages. That's your king. But as civilization returns, we see the evolution of aristocracy. From a king, one-man rule, to a noble rule, the, the warriors who fought. And these will be your noble families that have survived the Dark Ages. They are the oldest ties to the land. An individual polis is quite fascinating. Each of these will have a central location. The city will be around a central location. And this seems to be a high spot. This is a natural idea. A high spot protects you from floods, protects you from invasions. Uh, it'll be your last refuge in case of war. And each of these tends to have a high spot. This is the most famous, the one in Athens up on a granite mesa with their temples on top. But each of the cities usually had an acropolis, an acropolis, a high city. Another aspect that is just so fascinating is the loyalty. They have the loyalty to their city, not to Greece. There's no sense of a Greek identity yet. That's coming. But a sense of loyalty to their polis, that their polis is them. I liken this to a beehive, the mentality of bees to their hive. Everything is devoted to the hive. That is their loyalty. That is their life. With that comes citizenship. The men who have survived and the families who survived the Dark Ages have a tie to this city, and the city has a tie to them. There's a sense of citizenship, a sense of belonging, a sense of rights, a sense of that the city owes them and they owe the city. It's a reciprocal kind of uh, symbiosis going on. And a sense of pride that is unlike anything you could imagine in today's world, a sense of just absolute dedication. Again, like a bee to a hive. Um, a, a dedication and a pride such that your life is insignificant compared to the life of the hive. A bee will sting without thought of its own life. A bee will die to protect the hive at all cost. Another aspect is the idea of land. Greece is a beautiful place, wonderful for vacations and cruises, beautiful shorelines and beautiful blue water. But as far as arable land, a land that can be used for more than just olives or grapevines or goats, 
arable land is at a premium. And as these cities begin to come out of the Dark Ages, they've survived that, they begin war over land. This is the Greek warfare. Another aspect of them in the Dark Ages, uh, they come out of the Dark Ages, is war. As if there wasn't enough in the Dark Ages, now that civilization returns, the warfare continues, but it's a little bit different. It's going to be city versus city. Not so much city versus invaders or city versus barbarians, but city versus city, almost ritualistically, and they're fighting over land. Here's a city, here's a city, and in between is some land possibly, and that's what the fight's going to be over. Any kind of arable land in between these, because Greece is a rocky place. And so these fields, if there is a field nearby, that's going to provide a big food source to you beyond just goat meat and, uh, and olives. So by around 600 B.C., we see an evolution has taken place from just war, city versus city. Something amazing has happened. They have actually come up with a stereotype, a warrior in, in a uniform, and they all seem to be on the same page. They all seem to fight out of the same playbook. It's quite fascinating. We call these Greek hoplites, the evolution of a Greek hoplite, a stereotypical Greek soldier. Let's take a look at one. A Greek hoplite. Well, where the word comes from dates back to the 700s. The word comes from what, this, what is most important to a Greek warrior. It is his shield. If you look at the picture here, it is a big shield. It's about three feet wide. And if you hold it up and it's be held on your left arm, if you hold this shield up, it's going to cover from your neck all the way down to your knees. And this is your most important object. You must have a shield. Without a shield, you're not a hoplite. Their weapon of choice is a spear. Uh, sometimes if you watch Greek movies, they fight with swords. They did have swords, but that would be a secondary weapon. Your primary weapon when you go to war is a spear. It's a long spear, and where you would find a long piece of wood like that, that would be pretty rare. You might have had to import it from somewhere, and it's pretty valuable. It's not a throwing spear. It's a jabbing spear with a bronze point or an iron point on the end. And by about 600... You see them adorning their entire full uniform, the shield, the spear from the Dark Ages, and then a helmet, usually with horse hair on top to make you look taller, and then greaves, shin guards. So basically now, you are covered from head to not quite toe. Your head with a helmet, with just a little bit of space for your eyes to see through, a shield that covers from your chin to your knees when you crouch down, and then your shin guards here. Definitely one on your left shin, and possibly, if you can afford one, one on your right shin. And the toes look a little bit vulnerable there. But uh, pretty much you are a, a little tank. And this is really expensive. The city does not provide this. You must provide this. If you want to fight, if you want to go and defend your city or fight versus another city, you have to provide this. It's expensive. In other words, what sort of people are hoplites? Wealthy people. Not super wealthy necessarily, could be just middle class, but someone who can afford this and can afford to devote time to this and can afford to possibly die for this. And it's an important cause for them. Poor citizens can't participate. Wealthy citizens might not want to participate. It's a kind of a middle class thing. The armor is very expensive, would be passed from father to son. You can see the most Greeks would have a family crest or some kind of family symbol. So when you took the field, you could look across the field and see different families that you're fighting, and they would recognize your shield and your family. So it's expensive. It's passed from father to son. The next evolution beyond the hoplite now is the idea of a phalanx. This is an interesting evolution because the Bible, the Greek Bible, the Iliad, that's the book that now is written down. The story has been passed along and now written down. So all Greek boys can read now or hear the story. The story of the Iliad is one of heroes. So you definitely want to fight. The, your book tells you you need to fight. But the fighting is man to man. It's mano a mano. Achilles versus Hector. Your instruction manual tells you that when you take the field... You call someone out, and then you will fight, and then another pair will fight, and that's how war is to be fought. Man versus man, open ranks of people, wide field. But the evolution that takes place is one of not fighting that way. 
eventually they come up with, and I'm not sure who started this or where it started, but somebody decided, let's not fight man-to-man, let's fight as a line of warriors. And I'm sure that would have been a difficult choice to make, to go against your instruction manual, to say, let's form a line of shields. That probably would have been considered cowardice by somebody. And then that would have been effective. Instead of man versus man, let's have a wall of men all fighting at once. And then someone would come up with the idea of, well, let's put it closer together. If we all stand really close together, we can overlap our shields and become even more invulnerable. And then maybe the idea of moving forward as a wall of shields, like a tank, maybe. So that's the evolution from open field combat, man versus man, to let's line our shields up with our helmets and our spears, overhand spears, as a porcupine coming across the field. The Greek phalanx. This is from a vase. And you can see it, They lots of pictures like this of these shield walls, the soldiers all forming a wall, maybe playing some music to keep everyone marching at the same pace. So, the evolution, now we form a shield wall that's very effective as a means of war instead of man versus man. And now we need to practice moving in unison. The, the, the city, the phalanx that can form on the field and move in unison has a better chance of winning. So we need to practice that. A lot of training. You're going to need to not only buy your own equipment, but you're going to need to train on certain days. You're going to need to take the field with all these other men. In other words, not poor people, because you don't have time for this. Wealthy men, again, who can buy the armor, can afford to go out and train. And it's going to take skill. The better cities are going to win. And again, Greeks are very competitive, all about competition, which we'll come back to with the Olympics. Another idea is speed. The team, the, the city that takes the field with its phalanx and can move faster, maybe just one step faster as you begin to move toward each other, one step faster, maybe a little bit to the left and begin to get around a, the team's corner. Overcoming fear. They discussed this. How is the best way to overcome the fear of combat? Men are naturally frightened. What are ways to do this? Well, maybe kind of a system of training, maybe introducing 13-year-old boys to the battlefield slowly instead of just throwing them into combat where they might fail. So you end up with lots of warfare, phalanx versus phalanx, a wall of shields versus a wall of shields, and they'll come across the field and clash into each other, ramming into each other, and then jabbing with the spears. So phalanx warfare, now that you have your uniform, you have to have the uniform, the shield, the helmet, the spear. Um, you form a line of your hoplites, you'll overlap your shields, They'll overlap their shields. You come across the field toward each other. The, the weapon of fear is that spear. This long spear, you'll hold it about four and a half feet right in the middle. And it's got a point, a really sharp point coming at your face. And then uh, they'll come up with the idea of let's backing it up. Let's not just risk that first wall, that the first wall might crack and break. Let's have a second wall and a third wall. And they'll probably think they would have hit shields and then the second rank hit the back of the first guy and kind of push him in the back and then just keep pushing and pushing, both sides pushing, um, clash of shields, and then the pushing begins, jabbing of spears, so you're gonna, your most obvious spot is going to be your neck or your eyes, and then pushing and pushing. We think that these battles probably lasted anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. Possibly at maximum three minutes. How long can one side just grind and drive their legs and their shields into the other side before somebody starts to tumble and fall? And once somebody falls, you know, uh, the, the tumbling begins. And once you tumble, you're going to be easy prey once you're lying on the ground. So one side will break. And that's the victory. We don't think, as typical means of war, that they chased the other side down. It would have been just a a sign of, of manhood, that your side won, you've claimed the field, a field to be planted, and the other side will retreat back to their town in a shame and maybe try again next year to, to reclaim that field. Um, there would have been rituals involved, pre-game rituals, post-game rituals, and I use the word game here because maybe that's what it was to them, almost like a game over hundreds of years, fighting on the same field, probably record-keeping, and we don't think it was a mass murder. These wars weren't mass murders, just simply a claiming of the field. Maybe, um, I'm not saying nobody died. Obviously, spears are being flashed around and eyes being poked out. And, but not mass murder, not extermination wars, just wars of manhood. 
The next step in this, and the reason we're talking about this, is because of democracy. Democracy comes from this. All this warfare is going to have effect on democracy. It's a Greek word. Demos, the Greek word for people, and power, kratia, power of the people. These warriors, when they come home, back to their city, having claimed a field, might sometimes not feel all the, the, the benefit from this. In other words, I paid for my armor, I put my body, and I put my family on the line there, and the field's not actually paying me any benefit. It may be these wealthy men who are claiming the field and using it and prospering from it. So eventually, somebody's going to start to question, you know, why are we fighting this for someone else's war? And the answer is going to be, maybe the warrior should claim the government, the power of the people. Another interesting aspect about this war, which we think it's not mass murder, is that Greece actually prospered during this period. The period of warfare, constant warfare, city versus city, there's prosperity. It's quite strange. Um, a respect for citizenship grows. This is where it comes from, that your city is constantly fighting, constantly under warfare. And there is respect for citizenship in your city, or respect for citizenship in their city. And so there's prosperity. There's antagonism over certain fields.